I below the photo story on the Sun newspaper, article in Ibadan premises devolution of more powers and resources to states. It's on page six. Only unpatriotic Nigerians will vote candidates with questionable character. Obasanjo. It's on page eight. IGP presents 13.6 billion naira checks to 6,128 families of these injured police officers. Now, on the bottom of the thumb, Explosion Rocks Rivers APC campaign supporters injured. Full story on page 26. Yes, Lee. All right. Uh, well, let's also take a look at the leadership on Friday with uh, their headlines. Uh, below the nameplate, you have the following. Tinubu Mouse Construction Industry Bank vows to combat insecurity from all angles. NNPCL now sells petrol at 194 Naira per liter as scarcity bites harder. And the lead story says with the kicker 2023 presidency, Northern Elders in dilemma over choice of candidate. We are still weighing the options. That's according to Baba Ahmed. Vote character and competence, not religion or ethnicity, Sultan tells Nigerians. After DSS arrest drama, Welcome back, Mr. Governor, Zimama Buhari tells him near Philip. I won't tolerate incompetent and bad leaders who be vows. Explosion and heavy shooting now APC and PDP rallies in River Senedo. Leadership Award, uh, NCDMB, that's Nigerian Content Development and Management Board, owes success to teamwork and resilience. <laughs> And that's attributed to the board's executive secretary, Engineer Wabote. Details on page 8. Insecurity, article promises to engage traditional rulers. Chukubi. Kingsley, the, 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 the one you read out just before the last. Explosions, Ma, PDP, APC rallies in River State. Um, we are watching that one. Let's be careful. It's an ill wind that blows no one any good. Let's go to more handleable things, so to speak. CDM to sanction banks over new Naira notes that uh, they're not bringing them out, supposedly or reportedly. The CDM is insisting that banks must load issue notes through ATMs before the January 31st deadline. The question we want to ask is, why would banks want to hold the new Naira notes? Why? And if we have been making conscious efforts since some three weeks ago, maybe one month ago, to ensure that when an old note, that's the 200, 500, and 1,000, goes into the, 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 the banks, they don't come out again, wouldn't we have made real progress? I can tell you that I've seen the 200 Naira and the 500 Naira only two times. And I've, on separate occasions. Now, if the CBN insists on January 31 deadline, are we not heading for a situation where we could experience a last-minute stampede as Nigerians queue up at banks to ensure that January 31st does not meet them with the old notes still in their possession? Was it even necessary to impose a deadline? Couldn't we have allowed it to be a continuous process till the last old note disappears? Questions, 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 gentlemen. <laughs> well, well for, for me, yeah, on this platform, we've discussed this, you know, from another perspective. And I, I keep saying that the issue of um, issuing deadline in the country should be a thing of the past now. We're not in the military administration. If you want to um, administer a process uh, in which you want to achieve a result, such as this, uh, that this BCBN has been championing, then you have to design a good process for that. If you, if you put a deadline, you are already creating a chaotic situation before you get, before the time comes. Now, you keep withdrawing, since you have already announced you have new notes, why not have it sufficiently enough to ensure that all banks will have it. So you start issuing the new notes from the day you talked about the deadline. So that whenever you go to bank, you will be issued with a new note. Now I went to bank yesterday. I was issued with an old note and I was calling the 
the back guy. He said that we'll start with the ATM first. Meanwhile, I am taking some money. You are giving me an old note. I'm respecting you now to have a dollar from a bank. Eh? From a bank. So how is it going to work? How can the deadline work? I don't know. But whatever it is, I don't know. We we fit it squarely. You know, we don't want to recall what happened in the eighties when we did the change of nine. That was highly chaotic. You know. I don't um, know if Kensel is adding anything. I, 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 don't, I, don't, know. I don't know. No, no I, I'm I'm not uh, adding any comment. I, I think for me there are uh, two stories that are uh, very important. Kiran read part of it, but okay. that's has to do with uh, families of uh, civil defense officers uh, who lost their loved ones yes. and have been compensated. In our news bulletin, there was a story of the federal government and we saw the Inspector General of Police announcing uh, compensation for nearly 7,000 families of dead and injured police officers. Mm. Now, I, I think that everyone who has uh, observed occurrences in our country should be worried about the frequency and numbers uh, at which our uh, law enforcement officers are being felt. I'll give you, I, I, I'll give yeah. you three examples. In September of last year, Senator Ifan Uba was attacked somewhere around the Nuguku yes. or so. Mm -hmm. uh, he survived, but some of the police officers who were with him about four of them were killed. In October of last year, Apostle uh, Suleiman was uh, attacked in a district. Some several persons also died in that incident. Some of them, uh, I think about five or six of them, police officers. This month, uh, around the second or so of, of, of January, uh, uh, Ohakim, mm -hmm. as the former governor of Igbo State, mm -hmm. was also attacked. And police officers who were with him as, as guards or orderlies were also killed. So uh, the police authorities or the law enforcement uh, authorities should ask themselves these questions. Under what circumstances did they lose their personnel? Should they have lost their personnel in those circumstances? We're not talking about saying you, you are confronting criminals and so on and so forth. Some of them are uh, performing some of the private security guard functions and then they just lose their lives. And as the IGP said while presenting checks to these families, whether it is 100 billion or 1 trillion or the entire federal government budget, it cannot compensate for the life of one individual. If no. you are a father or you are a mother, the role you play to your family cannot be played by any other person. Money cannot compensate I, 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 that. Exactly. Why, should you, why should we be losing men and officers the way we do so regularly and in such large numbers. And people who are just adapted to, 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 to follow some individuals, why are they moving in convoy? Of what relevance are there in society? Simply because you are handling, you are, you are a senator, or because you are a one time governor, they will have six, seven policemen following you around. That is wrong. It is totally wrong because other Nigerians also have the right to be protected by the police. So why they have been, and when they, they are even killed cheaply, very easily, undepend, undependent, they don't, they don't, you know, it's like ambush. Before you know, they are dead. So why? Policemen killed train policemen. And what leaves me overruled is the seeming impunity. I'm sorry to sound a bit morbid. Mm. It is not, it's, it is no longer if it will happen. It's now a question of when it will happen again. And that is not good for the country. It's oh, not good at all. Convoy, convoy, and making noise on the road. And I, I've not seen it elsewhere around, around the oh. globe. I, I have not seen even in Sweden. I I, I ate with the, the Prime Minister of Sweden in 2014 in in a Chinese in a Chinese, a Chinese restaurant in Stockholm. He he was just there with two persons. And one man who took us there, well, well, a Nigerian man who lives in the, in Sweden, he said, "Look, this man will drive himself. We, we should watch. We waited, and the Prime Minister drove himself." I, I, I mean, no child, you can't even know that he's a prime minister. Because of what he went to a restaurant with his two friends, there is no one his car and left. You are told that a South African prime minister, uh, sorry, minister, might not actually see more than three people in a day because it's not made too much of um, uh, that um, Alpha and Omega in terms of handing out things. Well, I've not been there. Mm. I'm talking from what somebody told me. Mm. There are certain things we need to, you know, 
from him attitude from insanity and yeah. yet we claim to we order. don't have enough police personnel mm -hmm. oh sure they will tell you that we have some three hundred thousand or three hundred and twenty oh, about half of that number, including of course, minus those who have died now, yeah, uh, are those private security guard functions. And these are breadwinners. Okay, so it's just I was going to draw attention okay. to the other story. We took it in our bulletin. Uh, it's not on the front pages of the papers. Mm -hmm. Nigeria lifts ban on exportation of processed wood and charcoal. The details of the story indicated that this is a conditional lifting of a ban. Every, everybody who's concerned about our environment should be worried. I, I, I was very happy uh, because of reporting the story. There was a footage of the new dead uh, plane, planes in, in, in our country showing that there, well, are, there are no trees. Welcome the certification. Yeah, precisely. There are, there are no trees. So where are you going to get the wood you are going to process? Where are you going to get the charcoal? Do you get charcoal from sand or from wood? I, I imagine that what we should be told is that oh over a period of five years or over a period of uh, let's say the last 10 years we have planted 10 million new trees and they, and they have matured and they are ready for uh for for, for processing or for cutting or for felling mm -hmm. and, and, and they're processing for which you call out the charcoal ah, go to the rain, rainforest belt you have no trees the uh great great green world that we are talking about we are not making much progress and now you are saying that you are you are lifting um, a conditional ban on uh, exportation I, I think that there should be a, a, a rethink of this point. We have no trees and we have no trees to process and export, neither do we have charcoal. The first thing that appalled me was how the price of D, uh, uh, DPK, uh, kerosene, mm -hmm. shot up to over 800 naira yeah, per liter. That means, oh, trees, you're in trouble mm -hmm. because we can't afford uh, uh, kerosene anymore. Okay, that well, was actually the yeah, best problem. Gentlemen, we have to conclude this. Uh, for me, it's all about planning. You know, it's all about planning. All these uh, the certificate, uh, the certified areas, you yes. know, those can even be, you, you can even apply uh, deep irrigation on them and, 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 and we grasp them. It's their personal planning and it can, can be, be done. done. It can be done. Oh, all right, gentlemen. Yeah, 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 that's, that's a very good a point. You talk about drip good. irrigation, the point you made to Israel, and you know what they do mm. with regard to drip irrigation. Mm. In Senegal, there was a report with that last year or the year before mm. of, 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 of a campaign to replant mangrove in, in Senegal. And they had done over a million mangrove trees. Jeez. And that we have in the Niger Delta where those mangroves have been wasted okay. by petroleum exploration. Mm -hmm. They activities. grew a culture and believed in it. Mm -hmm. Not lip service. Yes. Okay, okay. gentlemen. Yes. Uh, well, Chukude, thank you so much. Thank you, Kiri. I've been here. I will see you again uh, on, on Monday. And this is Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the NTA. We'll take a short break now. When we return, of course, our attention will be focusing on uh, mental illness. Stay with us. Our country will work better. Our country will work better. Who go do work for us? Papa to Kambo. Papa to Kambo. For a better Nigeria. Good life. Now you will want to. Now you will need to. So people of Nigeria, they jolly for the better. Now one shell for the country. So ready to put Ashiwa Jubala Tinubu. the next president of Nigeria. Our people don't look the matter well. Then only for Tinubu. Don't do what it everybody. If you see, now you get the experience. When you go fit, you stick make our country better, make life sweet for we and our picking them. But Latin we don't get a better plan to chase down work for we youth, better school, the security of lives and property, unity and peace of all we country people, the people of Nigeria. But these and many other better things we in the book lies. It could make we all vote. I you want to put Latin a president of Nigeria. Vote Shin Shetima as vice president. Vote APC, the party where she groom. Now you see the the violent and criminal activities of indigenous people of Biafra and its arm wing, the Eastern Security Network, present the greatest threat in the Southeast Zone. However, kidnapping for ransom, armed banditry, communal clashes have been some of the security threats that the devil, the region. Accordingly, joint military operations are being conducted in the southeast to overcome the threats and to entrench peace and security. The military effort 
in collaboration with other security agencies are achieving the set objectives, which are the defeat of the threat and restoration of peace and security in the region. This message is brought to you from the Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. Nigeria is at the crossroads. Nigerians yearn for a rescuer. And the time to choose wisely is now. now. We will save our fatherland. We will rescue Nigeria. Only one man. He is battle ready, tested, untrusted, capable, and dependable. He is a Abubakar, we call him the unifier on a rescue mission. He's destabilized, uncompromised, and ready to make Nigeria great again. Atiku is coming together with Ifai Okoa. This team is unbeatable. This is no time for sentiment. It's time for competence. Atiku is the best option for a brighter tomorrow. Let's vote Atiku for president come 2023. Vote PDP. To the people. This message is powered by Senator Ehige Uzame. To every politician, as the campaigns gain momentum and passions begin to rise, remember the errors of your opponents do not make you a success. Do not run down your opponent and inflame passions to violence between and among your supporters. What counts is what you plan to do for the electorate and how you intend to relieve the sufferings and bring succor. Nigeria is in dire need of patriotic leaders at all levels, leaders who will make national development their priority. Concentrate on telling the electorate what you intend to do when you get into office. Focus on making your vision clear to the electorate. Don't engage in verbal abuses, fake news or speeches. Keep dealing with issues that will bring progress. You win the hearts and minds of the people by being a role for by being civil, patriotic and showing empathy. Let's train hands to make the 2023 elections peaceful. A message from the National Orientation Agency. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. Now, before we begin our conversation this morning, which is on the state of mental health in the country, following the new Mental Health Act, let's uh, listen to this background report put together by our correspondent, Abu Salam Jibril. A few days ago, the news of a young lady, Laura Okorodudu, that was rescued from a suicide attempt on the boundary river between Delta and Edo states made headlines. It was reported that she jumped into the river from the Ohara Benin Bridge. Her case is one of the increasing several suicide cases being witnessed across the country recently. While Laura's case has not been attributed to mental illness, a huge number of the other suicide cases have been attributed to mental illness. According to the World Health Organization, WHO, one in four Nigerians, that is, some 50 million people, are suffering from some sorts of mental illness. Similarly, data from the Global Health Body reveals that Nigeria has Africa's highest caseload of depression and ranks 15th in the world in the frequency of suicide. Some experts note that some factors hindering the management of mental illness in Nigeria include myths and traditional beliefs, inadequate mental health facilities, and a low number of mental health professionals. Towards turning this around, President Muhammadu Buhari recently signed into law the Mental Health Bill 2021 after two failed attempts in 2003 and 2013. The Act will replace the Lunacy Act of 1958, and experts note that it marks a major milestone in Nigeria's efforts to improve support for psychosocial well-being. The chairman of the Senate Committee on Health, Ibrahim Oluyagbe, stressed that the Act will bring about the desired changes in mental health management in Nigeria and establish human rights protections for those with mental health. 
what are the causes of mental health illness and how can it be managed appropriately? What impact will the act have on mental health management in Nigeria? These and more will be the focus on the program as guests speak to mental health issues in Nigeria shortly. Uh, thank you indeed, Abdul Salam, for that package. And uh, joining us in the studio to discuss mental health in Nigeria is uh, Chime Asunye Jedi, founder Nigeria Mental Health. Uh, welcome to the program, Chime. Thank you. It's glad to be here. All right. And uh, we are actually going to be having a guest uh, in our uh Ibado studio he'll be joining us very very shortly he is dr jibril abdul malik consultant uh, psychiatrist and the uh, ceo founder at sido foundation he'll be with us uh, in a moment all right uh Kieran, thanks a lot uh, we have uh, joining us for today's conversation uh, senator ibrahim Oluri Agbe, who is the chairman of the senate committee on health and sponsor of the mental health bill is joining us via Zoom from Ilorin, a Quar State capital. Distinguished Senator, we're glad to have you on the program today. And we also have joining us uh, via Zoom, Chinye uh, Rogo Onyekwere, a clinical psychologist of NIM Foundation. She's uh, joining us from Mauritius. Where she is uh, at the moment, and is a regular guest on Good Morning Nigeria. Uh, two years ago, we're glad to have you this morning. Good morning, thank you for having me. Okay, well. All right, I, I'm not, I didn't quite hear the sound from uh, Senator Oluri, but I, I would like to start this conversation with him. Distinguished Senator, if you can hear us now, uh, and uh, we can also hear you, as I said, we're starting this conversation with you. Why a new Mental Health Act in Nigeria? Well, we understand Kiran is not there, yeah. so that's... Uh, let's, uh, okay, let's go to Mauritius, you know, because we, we seem to have a very good, uh, you know, uh, link right now. The signal is quite uh, uh, good. Chiyere, or Chiyere, rather, um, let's think in the direction of the quest question that my colleague you know, put to the sponsor of this uh, uh, health bill or mental health bill. Uh, what do you think is the reason why Nigeria should have um, a, a new act? As a matter of fact, from the uh, historical perspective, uh, we had the 1958 ordinance. And again, it was presented uh, to the National Assembly in 2003 and then 2013 and all of that and that lasted this long and now we are seeing the act signed by the president do we really need a new act on uh, the nation's mental health um so there's a need for a new act um, the more we have conversations on our mental health and we realize the need and um, to update the existing act and the, uh, you know the act is there to guide the way mental health service is provided to nigerians and the quality of service that nigerians are receiving well, 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 if we had to go to the old okay, act it did not give yeah. us an up-to-date yeah, yeah. information yeah. about how to provide services to people about the yeah. right care to be given to people so there was a need for us to update this act and for us to work together and um, to ask for a new uh, a new bill and a new act that has been given to us um this new act steps in here now to give us a better um, opportunity for nigerians to, re to receive a um, better service when it comes to mental health care and mental health service provision well to you, let, let, let me uh, still stay with you why in your opinion did it take so long to uh, pass a new act as it were because if we recognize the urgency in reforming our mental health uh, law uh, the last time this was done was in 1958 and when the bill was first introduced in 2003 uh, it fell through and again in 2009 so wh why do you think that there was uh, some legislative reluctance in accelerating the passage of this bill which you said is so critical even though now it's a law 
So I don't, I don't know that I'm in the best position to answer that question um, because I would say from an outsider, I think, um, you know, a lot of the times the processes that involve um, legislation and taking things from one step to the other may be longer than they need. Um, and then you have change in hand and change in power. And then also we talk about interest. And um, if you do not have people that are fighting for this interest, it may take longer. We are very um, opportune and blessed that at this time we have legislators that um, and senators that are actually interested in mental health and want to push for the act. So I think it's the interest of the senators that um, and the interest of the um, you know the people that came together, a lot of the NGOs and a lot of the service providers that came together and um, to push this. And I think maybe. You know, it's been a long time coming. This is not the first time that we have talked about this. So all this put together may have led to why it's being pushed now. Um, but, um, I, you know, I, I think the fact that we have legislators who are interested in mental health now and who see the need for it and who want to fight the cause with us and who want to push with us um, has led to the act being um, provided to us now. Okay. Uh, thank you indeed. Um, let's come back here home uh, where we have... a. Uh, Chime Asoye. Uh, we just listened to the uh, best uh, you know, uh, responding there. And I want also to share your views with respect to the need for this act. Yeah. And again, after that, you could also go further to discuss the components of the act. Sure. You know, that you think uh, the, the new blood that may have been injected you know, into uh, the bill or the act now to the law uh, that uh, makes it uh, very, very uh, critical uh, at, at this point in time uh, that uh, we are trying to revisit uh, the nation's uh, mental yeah. health care delivery. Yes, um, and thank you for the question. And I'm excited that I'm seeing members of Nigerian Mental Health and individuals we worked with to push the act here, like Neem Foundation um, or Acido Foundation, etc. We're all partners in progress to push it. Like um, Chinyogo said, we came together as NGOs, diverse organizations, to push the act. And I think that does a big difference. Um, why the need for the act? We've been mentioning 1958 Lunacy Act. But the truth is that the conversation starts before then. Um, the Lunacy Acts Ordinance actually started as an ordinance in 1916, a British colonial rule. Um, and so we had a colonial law in Nigeria that the Britons also repealed themselves. They established a new, new act, right, um, essentially a little bit after our independence. So we had an outdated bill that was inhumane. The old act allowed individuals who were medical officers of, or um, government officials to actually chain individuals, um, which is very inhumane. And you can just tell from the name of the act, the Lunacy Act, which is implies um, abnormal or um, crazy or and allows for the stigmatization of individuals who don't that that prevent people from getting the help seeking behavior that they need. So the Human Rights Report actually um, shared a report saying that individuals in lots of government facilities were chained and locked up, and that's not how we treat those who are necessary for mental health. And when we think about why the act passed now, I think that there was a couple of different things that came together. One is that the <coughs> political interests. So Senator Alube, for instance, from the, the senator was very passionate about this bill that was very, very important. Secondly, there was a new thing that happened that we all faced, not only Nigeria, but the whole world, which is COVID. We all faced COVID. A lot of people were feeling lonely and depressed during that time. Mm -hmm. And so um, there was an increase in depression and anxiety. The World Health Organization says that in the first year of COVID alone, depression and anxiety increased by 25%. And the third thing I think is that uh, the diverse voices came together. So with Nigerian Mental Health, we actually had a letter that was signed by 30 organizations calling for passage of the bill. And so the, um, the civil society actors and different diverse actors from psychologists to psychiatrists came together with one voice and said, we need this act right now in this new time to really support um, individuals' psychological well-being. So what is new in the act? That's yeah. what I'm asking. Yeah. You know, what is the, the difference between the, uh, 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 the, the ordinance of 1958 yes. uh, you know, and what we have presently? So there's four key differences. Uh, the first one is institutions. There's three new institutions that are created by the act. One is the Department of Mental Health Services that are supposed to create guidelines 
for mainstreaming mental health into public health um, services. The second is the creation of a mental health assessment committee. It's supposed to be comprised of traditional rulers, psychiatrists, social workers, lawyers, and it's supposed to safeguard the rights of those with mental health conditions. The third thing is a mental health fund. We can't talk about the important programming that is needed, the important psychological and psychosocial interventions that are needed without talking about financing. If we look at the health budget, um, a very small amount is dedicated to mental health. Um, it's around three to five percentage points um, of the health budget. And if you look at what Nigeria promised in the Abuja Accords, we're supposed to have 15% of our budget um, geared towards health. A little amount is geared towards mental health. So we need the proper financing. And that's important right now because we just had a budget passed and yet we had a new mental health act. So if we think about implementing this new act, where is that funding going to come from? So we need to be start thinking about supplementary budget and things like that. <clears throat> a second is human rights. This act bans things like discrimination in education, in the workplace, in social services. It guarantees the right to information. It guarantees the right for individuals to have a place and a voice in the formulation of their treatment. Because a lot of people would have interventions on them and things like that, and they wouldn't have a voice or a place. Um, the third thing, it enhances care. And this is very, very um, important. It mainstreams mental health in provision of other disease-related things. So whether it's reproductive health or HIV training, you need mental health to be a, part, a core part of it. If you have individuals who have some sort of conflict or things like that, it does training to help de-escalate. It also establishes peer support workers. So you have people with mental health conditions, but those who have that lived experience can help support them, teach them how to cope with coping mechanisms and things like that. And the final thing when it comes to management that's really important is that it bans certain things. Um, it increases penalties for sexual exploitation. For instance, you have life imprisonment. Now, if you do anything like that, you can't have unfair research without proper um, protocols and regulations and things like that. So um, in the context of a new legislation, mm -hmm. um, it really does a lot to support institutions, improve care, um, improve management, and make sure that Nigerians really get the support and care that they need. Now, it's not everything. Oh, all right. Okay. It's not uh, everything. We'll we'll we have to but, pause you, uh, yeah. Chima, so that uh, we'll take the other guests. We understand that uh, Ibadan Studio is ready now. Uh, my colleague Kieran did say we're expecting Dr. Uh, Jibril Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik, of course, is a regular guest on Good Morning Nigeria and is a consultant psychiatrist and CEO founder of uh, Asido Foundation. Right there the, on the right side of your screen. Dr. Abdul Malik, welcome to Good Morning Nigeria. Very much. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and Happy New Year to all of you in the studio. You too. Now, against the backdrop of some of the points you often raised as a conversationalist on Good Morning Nigeria, and you, of course, experience in the field of psychiatry, does the new Mental Health Act 2023 present a new deal? Absolutely, and I'm very happy to align with the comments of uh, that's already ongoing in the studio to say that it is a breakthrough, major breakthrough. And I want to also mention that some of the reasons why it has taken so long for this to see uh, become reality is that to some extent it was not prioritized. So let's uh, simply call a spade a spade. It wasn't accorded uh, government or political priority or political will was simply not there. And the process of having a bill see the light of day is painstakingly thorough. First reading, second reading, public hearing, third reading, both houses achieving concurrence before it is forwarded to Mr. President for his assent. And so most of the time where there is lethargy or lack of political will and not having all stakeholders aligned previously were major determinants that caused it to uh, appear to be a Herculean task until now. 
the other key thing to appreciate is that uh, Chile already mentioned that the lunacy law of 1958 originally emanated from the ordinance law of 1916. And so you let's remember that as at 1916, we didn't have effective medications or treatments modalities for mental illnesses. As at that time, what was prevalent was that if someone had a mental illness, you simply remove them from the community and then locked them up in asylums and these are language these are the sort of language that is preserved in the lunacy act because that was what was available now from 1950s up until now there has been an explosion of understanding of how the brain works new medications new treatments that will allow people get better and return to full functioning and these are things that are not captured the other major problem that was not captured is the respect and promotion of fundamental human rights and the dignity of individuals anybody can have a mental health problem i can become depressed doctors professors lawyers anybody it's not a respecter the same way anybody can have a physical illness is the same way anyone can suffer from a mental disorder and so the fundamental aspect of human rights promoting dignity of the individual ensuring that they are treated in a humane manner are things that were also absent in the old law that are now corrected in the mental health act. So but we know that this is a long journey. It's going to be a marathon. This is just the beginning. There are many laws. There are many policies that are there gathering dust and are not being implemented. So we know this is just a first task. So while we rightfully roll out the drums and sell that we now have a mental health law that is in tandem with global best practices and respects human rights. We also know that it is not yet Uhuru. We have to consistently advocate and we hope that because the host ministries, the Federal Ministry of Health, and we have to give them kudos for midwifing this to uh, a successful conclusion, but implementation also is going to largely be domiciled at the Federal Ministry of Health and they need encouragement to establish the Department of uh, Mental Health to ensure oversight, ensure funding, so that this law does not become an, a law that is just gathering dust somewhere and does not translate into tangible improvements in mental health services delivery for all Nigerians. Thank you. Okay, um, the, thank you for also making it to this studio, you know, because we were expecting you. Uh, we we're glad you are there now. Uh, let's return to uh, Mauritius, you know, where we uh, see have uh, uh, Chinya we go. Okay, uh, well, uh, okay, be before we go to Mauritius, uh, let's uh, get uh, Senator Ibrahim Oluri. I, I, I hope that uh, we've been able to establish a, a history uh, 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 link with you, uh, Senator Ibrahim Olorebe is the chairman of the Committee on Health and sponsor of the Mental Health Bill. He joins us via Zoom. Once again, good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Good morning, Piers. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, we can, we can hear you very clearly. And uh, let me even ask you this, you know, because uh, as the sponsor of this uh, bill, which has, of course, uh, become an act, what came to your mind? What prompted you to do this? Because this is one of the, uh, you know, items that, that's been lying in the National Assembly for more than a decade now, and uh, you uh, resurrected it. Uh, so it's now a kind of a renaissance of, uh, of the bill, which has certainly become an, an, an act. What prompted you to make this move and proceed it vigorously uh, to the conclusive end? Uh, th thank you very much. I think the basic motivation for, I mean, for sponsoring, promoting and supporting uh, the bill that is now an act is because of my awareness and appreciation of the development, if I can use that word, of mental health illnesses or disorders in the country, especially the new menace of substance abuse, which is complication of mental and psychosocial disorders. But basically, I mean, before I came to Senate, I'm a medical practitioner and I'm aware of what is happening within the sector. 
Uh, just like some of the earlier speakers have said, mental health is not given its right to, right to priority either to before now. And uh, uh, many, we had a lot of effects of it that are not appreciated even in terms of the economic and security implications. Because many people do have depression and anxieties and things affect their productivity. But it's not, I mean, people don't relate the mental health conditions to what happens in the workplace or what happens in people's normal world, I mean, uh, living. As well as civil security problems that we have, most of the people that are engaged in criminal activities are probably uh, prompted by the either use of drugs or because they have certain mental health disorders in the background. So all this are uh, what prompted me to see that if we don't address that, it means our effort in terms of economic promotion, our effort in terms of addressing security may not achieve the desired result. So, and as the other speakers have said, I'm also aware before coming to the Senate of the effort it had to be done to get this uh, law to be in place. So we worked to, at the beginning of right, July 2019, we resumed. We had uh, uh, a meeting with my colleagues who are co-chairmen in the health sector. We set an agenda. And part of what we put in that agenda of what we hope to accomplish was getting this act to the uh, I mean, getting this bill to become an act. So, and I mean, I give kudos to my colleagues in the health committees, both in the Senate and the House of Health, and the leadership of both chambers for supporting our effort to be able to see this through. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your efforts, of course, along with, with your colleagues. But uh, lead our viewers uh, into some of the significant provisions in the new Mental Health Act uh, that will give us uh, the new breakthrough, as it were, uh, in care for mental health. Part of the question. <clears throat> what are some of the significant provisions of the Mental Health Act? Thank you very much. I think the first one is to set up an administrative framework that will enable uh, policies and guidelines to be set up. That is the establishment of the Department of Mental Health in the Federal Ministry of Health. With that, it means specifically we have uh, a body or a department that will be in charge of making necessary policies and guidelines for that. The second significant thing is the establishment of a mental health fund because for you to be able to address a problem, there's a need for resources. So a ring fence seeded fund is established by the Act and there are various sources through which money can come into that fund to enable whatever activities or whatever interventions are required to address mental health disorders is uh, achieved. The third one is the establishment of a committee which we call the assessment committee because uh what does happen now or uh, what is happening now is that uh, everybody can decide just to take an individual and decide to say this person should be chained or this person should be removed from society without the appropriate expertise recommending such so of course that's part of the fundamental right which i will go to so that committee uh, which is really added by the provision of the act is a multi multi professional in, uh, in this constitution. It has lawyers, it has psychologists, it has psychiatrists, it has social workers, and so on. They will assess the uh, they are the one to assess and make recommendations. And these committees will be from the national up to the state, and I think with time it goes to the local government, in which case in every uh every level of uh, the country in terms of our uh, arrangement, we have such a committee. Of course, there are provisions for the rights of individuals as far as mental health is concerned. They are right to health, they are right to life, they are right to own properties, and they are right to all other rights. Because, which are, for example, one of the menace we have in the country now is the fact that we have people setting up homes, people that are not qualified to set up such. And the big individuals or the other children or women and say, oh, these are witches, or this child is a witch, and they try to change such a person. They are not, by, the, by the effect of this law, those kind of things will have to be eliminated and be eradicated. Then all kind of treatments that are human, 
that are put on people who suffer mental health are bad and they are punishable because they are, they are not criminalized by the fact of the law. If anybody or any person engages in such, such persons when arrested will be prosecuted and properly be dealt with based on this current law. And there is also the provision of the right of the individual as to voluntary, uh, as to their right to be able to participate in their management. Because just, just like uh, Dr. Malik said, based on the current knowledge of the way brain works and the various drugs that are available, when individuals have issues with their mental health I and mean, mental conditions, they with, with the application of drugs, they are able to act, they are able to recover and be able to understand what is happening and they could participate. But where they are not even able to do that, the current bill now provides for them to have a legal representation, either from their family or from medical officers or appropriately they are provided prior with the law. How do we have such representation who will represent them? So that, therefore, like, like a physical illnesses, where you have a right to sign, where you have a right to be able to put give consent, the person with mental health also can either give consent or we give consent to a representative. These are all to be able to protect the right of the individuals. Well, one of the other major rights, if you look at the court, the literacy act that everybody referred to, is that a person with mental health is being deprived of his or her properties by the, by the previous existing literacy act. This has been returned by this law that the person still has control and access to the property. The Lunacy Act provides that if you have a mental illness, whatever you have should be confiscated and should be disbanded and so on and so forth. Very, very inhuman. These are out of the place there. The final one I want to mention is the method, new method of management of people with mental health. That is integrated method as well as community management of mental health. The current provision in the Act provides that the Department or the Ministry of Health will provide this, will require these guidelines and ensure through financing and other intervention to ensure that mental health is integrated as part of normal health services and especially from primary health care, including community care. In many countries in the world, one of the best practices to manage people within their community so that they are integrated, they are able to function like any other human being. So these are some of the provisions that are contained in the act that it, that has been signed. Over. <laughs> Thank you. Um, perhaps when we return to you, there will be some other specific questions, you know, uh, with respect to the fact that you are the man who generated uh, all of these uh, positive force that we are going to begin to experience in that uh, 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 health subsector. All right, let's return to uh, Mauritius. I hope we still have a Chinyarigo uh, there. Uh, Chinyarigo, you've listened to others, but I want to take you on this. They, they have actually um, enumerated uh, some of the um, you know provisions that found uh, their way into the Act for now, which we're hoping to implement adequately. But let me just take it one after the other. They talked about Department of Mental Health uh, Service in all hospitals, if I got it right. That means hospital should have a department of uh, uh, mental health now creation of assessment committees that's okay uh, mental health fund how do we generate this fund in question what are going to be the strategies for making sure that this fund is, is established now we talk about human rights uh, that's so um, human rights element that's the banning of discrimination and what have you also have experience of uh, visiting um, um, uh, 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 a psychiatric hospital, really. And I can see how stubborn people with mental illness can be. It is, in fact, if you are not trained to manage them physically in the first place, physically in the first place, they could be very dangerous. They could be very, I'm telling you, it's, it's difficult to do. I'm not, if you are there, you will know the fact that when you bring any mental ill person, you have to manage the person professionally. It's not just what every hospital can do. But with this act now, which will create the Department of uh, Health, uh, mental health in our hospitals, I'm thinking of uh, the possibility of uh, managing such persons in our hospitals. Give us uh, an idea of uh, how these items that found its way or are found their way in the, uh, in, the, in the act be implemented from one point to the other. So we can know 
whether it is even possible because we are very good in articulating beautiful policies that has been historical in this country we have one of the best globally in terms of articulating good ideas but when it comes to translating the ideas into practical reality we seem to have uh, issues with that um so the possibility of implementing this um is it is very possible we have that sort of, uh, professionals who are well trained um, in Nigeria that can offer these services. One of the things that we lack is the structure um, and the places where these people can go and can um, you know, offer these services. We've been talking a lot about the brain drain that we have in Nigeria, where we have limited number of mental health professionals to the number of Nigerians that may need this service. So what this provision or what this act does is that it creates an opportunity for these service providers for your psychologists, your psychiatrists, your social workers, your psychiatric nurses, even your lay counselors, even your counselors, and to have a space where they can come together and offer this service. It could differ um, with different centers where you go to, in a center where you go to, we expect that at the bigger general hospitals, when you have bigger departments, then you have each and every one of these professionals represented and able to collaborate and work together. At your community levels, we can step it down and we can train people to offer basic mental health service. We can train lay counselors or lay workers to offer basic mental health service um, to the community and that when we see severe mental health challenges, it cannot be escalated to the general hospitals or we can have a referral system where we are able to support um, the structures. But the structures need to be there. The opportunities need to be created because there are people, there are professionals who are trained and have the capacity to offer this service. So that's what this act does. This act is going to ensure that we have services and we have structures available for the professionals who are here to do their work. And that we can even train professionals too. It encourages the training of mental health professionals and people who want to do the work to be able to offer this service. It's very possible and it can work. And we've seen it work even in the smaller sectors where we work, where we train people and we get professionals together to be able to support um, structures that are already there for them. Thank you very much, uh, Chinyurugo. Uh, let me return to uh, Dr. Abdul Malik in our Ibadan Network Center. Uh, Dr. Abdul Malik, well, let's know where we are coming from. I always found it curious, for instance, that we had federal neuropsychiatric hospitals uh, in some parts of the country, namely, <clears throat> excuse me, the most popular ones being Aru in Abba Okuta, uh, Yaba, which people derisively refer to as Yaba Left. Uh, you also had at uh, Uselu in, in Benin. But I, I hardly ever heard of uh, a state government having its own psychiatric hospital. What what informed that and what did that therefore mean in terms of access to care uh, for uh, persons uh, who have mental health issues and how would that then be addressed under the new uh, legal regime? Um, thank you very much. Let me just quickly um, appreciate Senator Dr. Loriegbe. He deserves a gold medal from all of us for the legacy contribution of sponsoring this mental health bill that has seen the light of day. Thank you very much, sir, for your passion, for your dedication, and for all that you've done. Now, with respect to access to mental health services, the neuropsychiatric hospitals are present in every region. So there is one in Kaduna, there is one in Meduguri. I did my NYSC at the Neuropsychiatric Hospital in Meduguri. There is one in Kiari in Sokoto. And um, so then we have Uselu, we have Kalaba, we have Enugu, Lagos, Oyaba. And so, and there are also state hospitals, state psychiatric hospitals. Borno State has one, Ondo State has one. These are states like River State has one. So these are a few states that I'm aware of that have standalone state psychiatric hospitals. But back to the previous question that Chinyerogo was also responding to, let us remember that mental health is not separate from physical health, right? So when we talk about access to care, WHO defines health as physical, mental, and social well-being. And then when we now talk about people with mental health problems, it's a spectrum. The commonest mental health problems are things like anxiety and depression. And these 
patients, individuals with these conditions are not likely to be disruptive or physically aggressive and all of those ones. And then the same way that if you have an accident and you have a fracture and your bone is sticking out of your leg, for instance, if they take you to the nearest clinic, they may not have the expertise to handle that fracture. They may need to refer you. So everybody who has a mental health problem should be able to approach nearest clinic, whether it's a primary health care center, it's a general hospital, or a tertiary hospital, and be given care. However, if the medical practitioners on duty realize that this is severe and beyond what they can handle, then appropriate referrals can be dealt with. And even for individuals who are very aggressive or disruptive, which is a tiny fragment of those with mental disorders because if you go to a neuropsychiatric hospital you are more likely to see the really severe cases there that is not representative of the totality of mental health challenges within the society and even in those instances there are ways of calming them down using chemical restraint once you are able to sedate them, give them medications via injections. Within 24 hours, they remarkably are much better and subsequently easier to manage. So these are the these are the issues. And let's also not forget that mental health was uh, added as a component of primary health care way back in 1991 when Professor Oluko Ransom Kuti was Minister of Health. So there's a policy to that effect that mental health is the ninth pillar of primary health care. So what that means is that everybody, because primary health care is supposed to be the most basic and accessible level of health care. So you, in primary care, you can have antenatal services for women who are pregnant. You can have immunization services for children and so on and so forth. Similarly, you are also supposed to be able to receive basic mental health services within primary care. The reason that has not been happening is that the expertise to do so, the confidence to deliver on these services have simply not been there. And these are things that we hope with funding for the mental health uh, because you can't have funding if there is no budget line. So previously, the first time there was a desk officer for mental health, even at the federal ministry level, was in 2010. And then thereafter, there are instances, periods where there was a vacuum. There was no desk officer for mental health. Notwithstanding the fact that mental health is one of the three components of health, physical, mental, and social, there was no representation for mental health, even at the federal ministry level. So now that there is a department once that is established statutorily during budgeting there will be budget allocation for that department to function and subsequently that should be replicated across state levels too and once there is that funding mechanism that will empower improvement of services employment recruitment which will also reduce brain drain especially for mental health professionals we have very few clinical psychologists working in government employment working in departments of mental we need more psychologists we need more psychiatrists we need more psychiatric nurses social workers multidisciplinary to be able to deliver quality mental health services that is in tandem with global best practices and that promotes fundamental human rights over yes i i i, I i'm really good you know what i had for me that uh uh, we have uh, some uh, psychiatric hospitals uh, across the nation, and, and then some three states you mentioned out of uh, to, uh, 36 that uh, have a uh, state owned uh, psychiatric hospital. But I, I think that uh, the, the number is not commensurate, you know, with the level of uh, the, the preponderance of uh, you know, mental illnesses that, that, that we have. Now, let's begin to go to the nitty-gritty of this conversation with respect to really what is mental illness. I know that. Uh, a mental disorder is characterized by a clinically significant disturbance in an individual's uh, cognition or emotional regulation or behavior. Yes. And again, we have uh, uh, appetite disorders, mood disorders, eating disorders, psychotic disorders, personality disorder, dementia, and what have you. So it's a variety of these uh, uh, this mental illness, you know. How can they be categorized, uh, especially when they visit a hospital? If you don't have a uh, cl clinical psychologist, like, uh, psychologist like, like, he, like he pointed out, in a hospital, for instance, who has a department of uh, you know, mental uh, uh, health, 
what happens because individuals with different kind of disorders you know perhaps could need different you know oh, the type of uh, you know treatment yeah. some might not necessarily be you know medication it could be uh, um, uh, you know counseling and what, what have you so it, it, it's a whole lot of uh, you know you know you know, you know complex uh, issue mm -hmm. to address these illnesses because that that, that that quite a number i think that that's a great point and it and it echoes your point about why this needs to be state-based and not just a one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. national approach that you guys were mentioning before i address that i would like to um again echo the thanks to the senator and to the um, federal ministry of health and other development partners that really supported this effort and appreciate his acknowledgement of the efforts of civil society to support this i've had a number of engagements with the senator and i can tell he's passionate about this it's important to him and we hope that he'll continue to implement this going forward um so uh, to, to your point um mental health conditions affect one-eighth of the world. It's actually the largest disability that people don't really realize. And it, they, we can't have a one-size-fits-all approach. So you guys were mentioning state hospitals. We need this Mental Health Act to be domesticated in the states. Currently, we only know two states that have a Mental Health Act, which is Lagos and Akiti State. Currently, they're having conversations in Oyo State, but if we don't, if we want these institutions to be created at the state level and the subnational level, then we need to make sure that we domesticate it around. So every state should listen, take the leadership of the National Assembly, and also pass and the president to pass these kind of um, laws. But we also have varying kinds of mental health conditions, and um, because of that, I would say that we need individuals to be evaluated. So, and we need to help promote help-seeking behavior. One of the challenges that we have is people don't want to talk about this to their family and to their friends. And so the act helps support this by destigmatizing it. It's not called the Lunacy Act right now, but we need other regulations to help support the act. One key thing that um, um, Nigeria Mental Health and partners are calling for, 40 civil society organizations have said that um, in order to make the act effective, we need to decriminalize attempted suicide. Decriminalize attempted suicide. As it stands right now, um, according to the Penal and Criminal Code, individuals who attempt suicide are can be locked and jailed. And there's reports on this in Punch and in CNN, and it's very unfortunate. And the World Health Organization says that the fact that suicide is uh, attempted suicide is criminalized actually prevents individuals from talking to their friends and family about this. So if we want the act to be effective, then we need to make sure we decriminalize suicide. We also need to get people to understand what are the core aspects are in the bill. And currently, that means a gazetted copy of the bill. We're waiting for that from the National Assembly and the presidency, an official copy, so we can just make sure that we can have the exact language so we can translate it in different local languages, whether it's Yoruba or Igbo or Hausa, so people can understand their rights down at the base level. It's very, very key. And the final thing I would say is that people should be, though there's things like depression and anxiety that people are facing, people should, um, Go get evaluation, ask for help. If you notice anybody who has um, different types of factors, whether it's um, work, being less productivity, illogical thinking, um, apathy, you're seeing different changes, you should be help them, talk to them, and make sure that they can have help. Some of our partners within the Nigeria Mental Health have helplines, and if you go to our website right now, you can go to, which is www.nigeriamentalhealth.org, we actually have a list of state helplines along with civil society helplines that people can call and ask and get some of the help that they need and also the referrals that others individuals are mentioning whether they need counseling or other type of psychiatric interventions all right uh achievement thank you very much there for uh, the points you've raised i think uh in terms of the criminalization of attempted suicide Lagos state has uh, decriminalized attempted mm -hmm. suicide mm -hmm. Uh, I, 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 that's one of the states mm. I am I'm setting of at, at, at the moment. Well, the population of Lagos uh, is probably the highest in the country, and other states uh, could take a leaf uh, from or borrow a leaf uh, from what Lagos State has done. I want to return to uh, Senator Olori uh, By the way, distinguished Senator, we need to remind uh, our viewers that uh, four years ago in the 2019 elections, 
uh, defeated the then uh, Senate President uh, Ulu, uh, Saraki uh, in the uh, senatorial election. Uh, you know, you have managed uh, the senator uh, for uh, your your district, uh, of course. And here we are today uh, discussing uh, a milestone bill that you sponsored and for which you have also acknowledged the contributions of others. I, I, I would like you to also speak to this aspect of what needs to be done at the sub-national level. I know that uh, Dr. Abdul Malik uh, mentioned that to say that there might then be an instigation from the federal level when they begin to see uh, that uh, at the federal level there is now established a Department of Mental Health uh, Service. We know that the federal government doesn't make laws uh, for the states, uh, but uh, we also know that sometimes uh, the subnational entities lag terribly behind uh, in, in terms of responding uh, to promptings by the federal government or initiatives that are otherwise laudable. What do you hope to see at the subnational level? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, let me uh, I, I mean, provide some additions to the earlier speakers. Uh, Dr. Malik was uh, mentioning the federal establishment that we had at Anu Psychiatric Hospital. I'm pleased to also say that uh, in the last three years, we have been able to expand access. Either two before we came on board in 2019, there was no federal psychiatry in the whole of North Central, six North Central State. However, we have been able to do uh, starting from January 2022, we'll be able to establish a federal psychiatric hospital in Budu uh, and Kwara State, which is cover or provide uh, mental health services for North Central Zone. So I mean, all the other five zones in the country had federal psychiatry before we came on board, but North Central did not have, which, and that's where my constituency happened to be. So we appreciate the Federal Ministry of Health and the President particularly for approving that uh, we, we started it through the legislative process. We are able to amend the uh, Federal Psychiatric Act and uh, included an additional one. The other addition I want to make is that we are also in the process of gazetting the act. I had uh, uh, the last speaker mentioning that it's an administrative process that will enable the, I want the, the act has to be gazetted for it to be implemented effectively. Well, we're already we're working already on, that, on that, that and uh, I'm working with the National Assembly, uh, the clerk the office to be able to get that done hopefully by next week. So those are the additions. Now to your question. But the Nigeria is a federation, and uh, the, one of the things that we need to understand when um, we are implementing yeah, yeah, is that the federal, federal has the possibility and the states do have their own. I hope I'm, I'm back to you. I want to confirm that I'm on. So the sub national there appears to be a lot of movement where you are. You are back now, stable, but perhaps you will throw more light on your face uh, so that the silhouette effect leaves. Thank you. So as this of current list, the state has responsibility. Just like Dr. Malik said, we do have some states that have psychiatric hospitals, and of course, in many of the general hospitals, you may have psychiatric nurses. On some states, they do have psychiatrists but there are very few. So the responsibility by the virtue of this act is for the state also to adapt the national act by creating the Department of Mental Health in their various states. Through an act uh, of the state assemblies, they will be able to adapt, as we said, uh, the national act to domesticate it in their state, which will enable the state to establish a Department of Mental Health, to establish also the assessment committee and be able to provide funds that will enable services to be provided. I hope and I expect this to happen. The current mechanism in the country to enable that happen is the National Council on Health, where all the states, the 36 state and FCT, meet with the uh, federal minister for them to set up guidelines and policies for health. It is our hope that once this act becomes operational now, that all the states and the FCT we domesticate the act and take from the act what they need to do so that we can have full implementation across the country. 
your okay. own uh, by bringing the bill, which has, of course, been uh, signed into law. You have done your own. But uh, experience over the years, you know, has shown that uh, when it comes to any, any item on concurrent list, you know, the states don't even key into federal government policy. Well, I'm sorry about that, but that's what the situation is. Apart from COVID-19, I mean, which was like a pandemic, everybody had to put hands on deck. Otherwise, the states would have been, you know, uh, they would have been uh, 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 resistance, you know, in terms of uh, keying into the policy. Well, because it's a deadly thing, everybody came in. But in this case now, we hope that uh, they really think uh, and, and play their role at subnational level. You are watching Good Morning Nigeria on the NTN Network service. You take a short break now. When we return, we'll continue with the conversation. <laughs> Are all Nigerians against all odds? We shall and must remain united. We may have our challenges, our problems, and setbacks. However, together we shall overcome them all. What doesn't break us shall make us stronger. This is the mindset that shall bring peace, progress, and prosperity to our beloved country. Do not let tribal and religious sentiments govern how you think. Act. Or be. Don't be influenced by those who want to destroy our precious national unity. Everybody who's a Nigerian is your brother and your sister. This is the mindset of the new Nigeria. It is also the mindset that we all adopt. Let us support each other in creating the Nigeria of our dreams. This message is from the Nigerian Television of The violence and criminal activities of indigenous people of Biafra and its arm wing, the Eastern Security Network, present the greatest threat in the Southeast zone. However, kidnapping for ransom, armed banditry, communal clashes have been some of the security threats that the devil, the region. Accordingly, joint military operations are being conducted in the southeast to overcome the threats and to entrench peace and security. The military effort in coordination with other security agencies are achieving the set objectives, which are the defeat of the threat a restoration of peace and security in the region. This message is brought to you from the Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. Our pastors, our imams, in every church, in every mosque, please realize that in the course of praying for peaceful and transparent elections, we all have duties beyond prayers. If we want a stable society before, during, and after the elections, what should you be saying to those that worship with you? All Sundays and all Fridays, you are saddled with the responsibility of bringing up good generations. It is therefore your duty to both man and God to ensure peace all the time. Matter about elections alone, people talk to people and people listen. Talk to your followers. Make them listen to ensure peaceful 2023 elections. This message is from the National Orientation Agency. Every day in our country, senior citizens are discriminated against, disparaged, and treated with disdain by those who ought to respect them. We are all complicit in the way we have treated the elderly members of our society as institutions families or members of a shared society. Every time senior citizens get offered less than they deserve for the work they do because they are old, poor and desperate, we are failing them. Senior citizen loses a child and wow, they must be responsible for their death. Every time a senior citizen gets labeled a witch, is called mad and shooed out of the way because they have no memory of what and look unkempt, we are failing them. We say, I beg, you don't old, make it do die, make everybody rest. To ailing parents, uncles and aunts. That's discrimination. That is neglect. 
When you see an old woman getting beat up and being accused of witchcraft, do not turn the other way. Stop and teach people that white hairs, wrinkles, and hunchbacks are no evidence of witchcraft. Aging comes with a memory decline. Sometimes it's not out of place to have elderly people lose their way, forget details of their lives, and how to properly take care of themselves. When they get to this stage, they deserve your empathy, not scorn. Our ailing fathers, mothers, aunties, and uncles are deserving of quality health care and peaceful transition. Make their last moments memorable. Senior citizens have paid their dues. They deserve your care. Stop all forms of discrimination against them. To All right, yeah, welcome back and stay in Good Morning Nigeria and the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. Uh, let's return to Dr. Jibril Abdul-Malik here about the network uh, studios. Dr. Abdul Malik, as I said uh, earlier, you've been a frequent guest on, on Good Morning Nigeria. I, I recall that on one occasion we uh, discussed traditional mental uh, health care practices, uh, including the, uh, the detention, quarantine, and dehumanizing treatment of persons in unprofessional and even unsanitary conditions. Under the new act, from what you know, linkage or convergence or divergence between orthodox mental health care and traditional mental health care. Right. Uh, thank you very much. This is a very important uh, aspect that we need to uh, address. Let's not forget that people usually assume that because we are orthodox and Western uh, medical, we have Western models of medical training that we are opposed to anything that is traditional or faith-based healing. That is not correct. Let's also remember that every tablet or injection that we use in orthodox medicine originally was isolated from herbs. So we are not discountenancing the fact that some herbs may have beneficial uh, effects in terms of treatment. However, the biggest challenge is the fact that it is shrouded in secrecy and they say, oh, it's the gods that have told me you we can't tell you what's inside. Just take this concussion and drink it. Unlike uh, medications that we know the dosage, we know the side effects, we know when it is safe to use, we know when it is not safe to use. And so that is one major barrier. The second major challenge is the inhumane um, practices that go on in those places, and such as chaining, such as physical beatings in form of exorcism whether uh, by all types of faith-based religious houses, beating, um, deprivation of food and drink as a form of fast for a long period of time to chase out the demons or the spirits. These are inhumane treatments. So the benefits of the new mental health law is that it provides oversight, regular oversight for any. So it did, the act didn't say, uh, hospitals alone or um, orthodox practices. Any facility that is going to offer services for persons with mental illness has to be regulated. There needs to be oversight. That ensures that there is quality control. That ensures that inhumane practices do not continue to occur in those places. And then they will have some form of accreditation i think the committees will have to work out the details in terms of protocols in terms of uh, procedural uh, policies and guidelines to regulate but the most important benefit is that now there will be oversight regulation for every and any facility that purports to offer services for persons with mental health challenges or disorders i think that is a significant uh, improvement over yeah, yeah. Uh, for what he said, really, Kinsley, I, well, I am 
I'm not an advocate of uh, traditional or tribal medicine, as, as it were, but I've been privileged to cover tribal uh, fairs where you meet uh, all my professional medicine men, you know, who claim, not just claiming, they will display it, you see it, they will do it, and so on. And again, the issue of beating, as he talked about, is very, very, very bad. But you also get beatings in hospitals. I said, look, take take a trip to a psychiatric hospital and see new 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 patients coming in look it's, it's, it's not a good thing to experience they are violent completely bad as a matter of fact in some cases if you don't beat them or hurt them they'll destroy things there i've seen them i mean you know, i like experiencing things seeing things myself i'm not just telling the story you know in any good psychiatric hospital for that purpose i want to know what is happening there you could see that look if you don't have well trained personnel medical personnel all the personnel yeah. like work with the, the, the otherwise you cannot control what is happening there depending on the kind of disorder in question you know right but the violent ones are always there they are, they are more in number if you ask me in such hospitals you know you know Kira, mm. <clears throat> each time we uh, talk about the mistreatment mm. in traditional way and you are also illustrating mm -hmm. now uh, so the psychiatric hospitals of persons with mental health mm. illness I, I, I've never been able to erase from mm. my memory mm. uh, a, a, an incident uh, it, several, it lasted for uh, several weeks or months in the, in the 70s. Mm. There was uh, a, a gentleman, uh, it was in the early 70s, I, I recall that. Uh, he was in our neighborhood mm. and uh, obviously had a mental health issue, so he was mm. uh, inside the house and uh, his, his relatives. Uh, you know, took to flogging him, and uh, of course he was a very dehumanizing, mm. uh, dehumanizing situation. I remember his name. Mm. I, I, I still remember some of the expressions that he himself mm -hmm. uh, would be uttering at the time they are flogging him. Mm. It was uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. you know. <laughs> I mean, that's that's mm -hmm. uh, which means that he wants to drink the water from Moloko. That is the uh, river water, the ocean mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm all local, uh, you, know, you know, but it, it, it got slightly, I don't know whether it was the beating or whatever, mm -hmm. it got slightly better, but unfortunately, uh, sometime in 1978, was right there uh, on a uh, motorcyclist ran into him. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, you know, some of them I said to be <clears throat> spiritual and, and so on. And that brings me to the next question, which I will put to, you can also share it if you have time to cheer where we go. Uh, uh, oh, 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 oh. Uh, there, is, there are basic misconceptions about mental health in uh, this part of the world. And uh, what level of sensitization do you think is needed to get uh, people educated adequately on better understanding of mental health? Somebody who has personality <laughs> disorders is a level of mental health that may not be violent, but may not be productive and things like that. Uh, somebody who has a psychotic disorder may not necessarily be violent, but somehow is the, is, uh, is, has a lot of uh, misdemeanors and, and, and what have you. Uh, so how do we get Nigerians to understand this? Because I would say it is spiritual. It is a, uh, a, a witch that did it and, and, and what have you. Um, thank you for that. Um, you know, awareness, 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 advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. That's what we keep on preaching. We're starting with this program. You know, we're continually talking about mental health and educating people. And for me, it's not about using big words. It's about making it as simple and as simple and as easy as possible, explaining what it is. You know, for the longest of times in our language, in our communication, and mental health has not necessarily been portrayed for what it is. And so sometimes when I see, uh, quote unquote, the ignorance, when I see people um, using the wrong terminologies or, or speaking wrongly about mental health, the onus is on me also as a practitioner to constantly educate and remind and, and you know, teach people the right words to use, the right care to support, and give them that basic understanding. We've come a long way, and um, we've come a long way in the conversation around mental health, and we still have a long way to go. And we have to continually talk about it. We have to continually advocate. We have to continually speak about um, the, the, the the humanization and speak about the need for human rights for people that have mental health challenge. And we have to continually use the right words and the right terms to also correct people and the words that they use. So there's a lot of education has to happen it's not going it doesn't need to stop with only one conversation it has to be continuous and it has to be simplified 
and it has to be made appropriate and correct for everybody to understand and to digest what it is. We have a long way to go, like I said earlier, but we have made an impact. We have made some difference. With this new um, act that has been established, you know, there's a lot of conversation about human rights and about giving people some more dignity, even if, we're, even if they suffer. We cannot separate mental health from humanness. We cannot separate mental illness from any form of illness. You are a human being. You may have a mental health challenge. It's still you as a person. So we always have to have that conversation that even if you have a mental health challenge, there's care out there. There's, you know, there's the right medication. There's the right support. There's the right care out there. And even for individuals, even for individuals that may have family members that have mental health challenges, all themselves have mental health challenge. You know, there's a right care out there. So the language needs to be used. Continual advocacy, continual education for mental health. And that's the way we begin to change the narrative because that's what we need to do. We need to change the narrative around mental health. And, you know, we're getting there. Slow and steady, we'll keep on doing it. Continuously, we'll keep on doing it. And we'll keep on changing the narrative of mental health. All right, uh, Chinyogo, thank you very much. Uh, Chinyogo, I would like you to also chip in here. Uh, with respect to the long haul on, on advocacy. Yeah. Uh, because there, in our environment, uh, there's a lot of stigmatization around mental health. Yeah. If somebody manifests maybe the lower end of mental health uh, condition, and the, the man decreases, or the mm. woman decreases. <laughs> yes. You know, you just not dismiss him like that. Uh, some persons who also have mental health could also live in self-denial. So there's nothing wrong with me. Yes. There's nothing wrong with mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. No, no, no. So there's nothing wrong with me. So I'm not saying you. I'm the person who say that there's nothing wrong with me. So uh, uh, what opinion uh, needs to be done uh, to accelerate uh, uh, public okay. enlightenment with respect to mental health against the backdrop of what we are seeing, the country... Is, is a wash with illicit drugs and yeah. young persons are losing their way. Well, we need to, thank you for the question. We need to, awareness is important, but as you mentioned, faith and traditional, can't we can't run away from it because when people are, have the most distress or the most emotional challenges, usually they run to their faith leaders, they run to their traditional rulers. So we have to engage them. That's one of the key. If we want to get this messaging out, we have to meet people where they are. If you look at the top five issues when it comes to mental health, or when people consider mental health, two of them, according to Epi Africa and the Africa Polling Institute, have to do with faith. So we can't run away from them. We have to engage in conversations. There's organizations like Lux Terra that are training pastors, for instance, about suicide and things like that. So our organizations as a coalition is secondly, we have to engage in popularizing it, which means working with celebrities and uh, influencers in the conversations in the media. MI, for instance, had a campaign with another organization called My Guy, Are You Alright? And it was just saying that if people have a challenge, they should just talk to their guys during men's mental health and say, are you all right? I, we've noticed that you're, you've withdrawn. We've noticed that you're having challenges. Are you all right? So we need those type of public enlightening campaigns. And three, we need to get the data and information out there um, and do these convenings. In Nigeria Mental Health, we're having community wellness workshops where we're getting people together to discuss some of these issues. We're going to have a major conference coming up where we will have people use technology so people can experience what it means to be a mental health. And hopefully doing some of those um, types of programs will really de demystify mental health going forward in the future. Oh, all right. I, I don't know what I was to we are pressed it, well, yeah, yeah. Well, to chip in any question uh we just uh, round off for this edition of the program you know i think it's mental health. i hope we'll have time to discuss it again intensely you know mm -hmm. what is that mental health i mean it's so in it's this case we, we discuss the act yes but uh, perhaps next time we'll delve into the real intricacies of mental health you know, because you know when you share experience like somebody you said you knew yeah. i worked with somebody in really nigeria growing up on this job right mm -hmm. very you know in the 80s right even a librarian nice nice man he got a, a visa to go to america all of a sudden he said he wasn't going to america then he left the job as well you see him on the streets of Enugu, moving everywhere mm -hmm. preaching gospel mm -hmm. you know looking cattle and all of that yeah. if, if you accost him you come to you as somebody you knew i mean you yeah. talk normally and he didn't get the service but he needed. said no that he went and played a song very very good song then oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that the, the world is in pieces Mm. I mean, this guy, you, you see him on the street, he will move in, talk to him quietly, gently discuss with you, and, and he continued doing that. I don't know what happened to him after all, but mm. this lesson for, for years. Yeah. He left the job, all of that. He wasn't looking in anymore. But he 
taking sense. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a mental, it's a mental uh, issue. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kira, Kira, there's no, no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. It's a subject that we'll have to return to. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, children in the 60s and 70s, where they see uh, a mentally, uh, sorry, a, a mental health patient, mm -hmm. that was, let's say, mad mother, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they will give them nicknames. Yes. You know, you give them nicknames. I remember, some of, I remember some of those, that stigmatization, yes. some of those nicknames, one called Aquite, another one called uh, Danger Light, you know, very violent woman. And you mad women making yes. babies, making yes. babies yes. on the streets. Yes. All right. But, so we'd like to thank all our guests for being with us on the program this morning. Of course, we have opened a fresh aperture in terms of uh, the new Mental Health Act uh, in Nigeria, which of course became law when we were sent to it by President Muhammad Buhari. Let's uh, appreciate uh, uh, Ibrahim Oluriebe, of course, who is a senator from Kwara State, uh, the sponsor of the bill, and of course worked in tandem with all others. Uh, Tabu Malik says that you should be galanded with uh, gold medals. So we uh, give you this gold medal uh, this morning. Uh, distinguished Senator, uh, thank you very much uh, for your efforts. From uh, Mauritius, we're joined by Chiyo Reugo Onyekwere, the clinical psychologist of NIM Foundation. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution to, to this uh, conversation. Dr. Jibril Abdul Malik, consultant psychiatrist and founder of uh, Acido Foundation. Always a delight having you on Good Morning Nigeria. And here in the studios, uh, Chime Asanye, uh, JD, uh, that is Juris Doctor, uh, founder of Nigeria Mental Health. We appreciate your being our guests on Thank the program. Thank you so much. Let's go over to our sports desk.